this relentlessness of or like this drive that you're talking about to achieve goals and to like keep evolving in you you as a person and your professional career that that stays uh i think what's different is is like the times of your life welcome to real creative leadership a video podcast produced by the stoke group and hosted by me adam morgan Today's topic is really interesting because most of us have started our careers with a sense of urgency. I know I did. Back in the day, I was like, I got to get ahead. You got to get ahead. Got to get ahead. And we feel this pressure to do you know, what we call the H word, um, the hustle, right? Um, but today we want to talk a little bit more about that because I know there's a lot of bad connotation today around quiet quitting and, and how we really should you know, be presenting ourselves in the workplace but there's still a reason to kind of work hard at your career. And it's maybe for different reasons than you think. So while we're taking the initiative and learning new skills and trying to you know, grow our careers, there's still a lot of little extra work we got to put into things. So today we're going to talk about the creative hustle, if you will, and we're going to put context around it. Like what does that really mean today? And how is that different from what it's been in the past? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to talk also about, you know, how we can find the right creative strategies, how we can put the right work in and spend the right amount of time on the right things. So today I'm excited to welcome Nicholas Mejia, who is the head of creative for Shop at Shopify. He's a bilingual creative with 20 years of experience working across markets and on agency, client, and product teams. The catalog of brands he's worked with reads like a Forbes list. McDonald's, Amazon, Sony, Pepsi, Toyota, Nintendo, the list goes on. Hello, Nicholas. Welcome. And by the way, you actually go by Nico, correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you so much for having me, Adam. Well, this is an exciting topic. I mean, I know that I've had a lot of little side conversations with people on my team about this one of what do you do? How do you get ahead without breaking your back and working, you know, hundred hour work weeks? Yes. But first let's start a little bit about you. I want the audience to understand a little bit more about you. So tell us awesome. about your creative career and your relationship with creative leadership. And then we'll get things going. This will probably be a, lo a long answer, but just to give you like all the, all the context, uh, because yeah, my creative career has been like quite a, quite a journey. I fortunately, I've been very lucky to have some incredible creative leaders and, and mentors throughout my career. Um, I started really early while I was still in, at college, like 2003, this is like 20 years ago. Um, low SSP three was like the hot agency at that time. They were starting to submit to can and starting to win, which in Latin America 20 years ago, it was not seen too much only by. Argentina and Brazil, probably. I always saw that agency like the last step in my career. I ended up being the first one, which actually worked out nice. quite nicely because I learned so much our, from our boss, Jose Miguel Sokolov. He, he was tough, but he was such a good uh, chief creative officer. So it was a really good lesson when I was so young. From there, you start changing agencies, right? Like we do in that agencies. I... I took the I'll double your salary offer early on and went to BBDO, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, I did it for the money. I accept it was not the right move from a creative perspective. Uh, and then I ended up and Leo and Leo was also a really good experience. And from that experience is that I felt that I wanted to move to the, to the U S. So that's uh, another story to say for later, but that eventually ended up happening. I ended up moving to the U.S. to work in Hispanic market. Then I worked on general market. Uh, Andres Ordonez, another Colombian, that at the time was the chief creative officer of, of BDO Chicago. He gave me a, an opportunity to go work with him, which was an amazing opportunity. From then I went to Ogilvy, also a great opportunity to work with Joe Sherota and Tito Ramirez, who, funny enough, he was my best friend. From, he is my best friend from college. He did all his career at Ogilvy. I jumped around quite a bit, but we ended up working together uh, at Ogilvy for a few years, which was super fun. We did some really cool work. And then the move to client side came. I started this, this uh, MBA on creative leadership at the Berlin School. And one of the things I realized is that um, I wanted to be a little bit even closer to how things are done, like more like the behind the scene of things. Uh, and I think like on, on an agency side, no matter how good relationship you have with your client, you never get to go as far into like planning a product or planning what's going to happen. So I guess that was like my interest. I love tech. So I tried Fangs. Amazon ended up working out. I was there for four years and now I've been here at Shopify for a year and a half. 
That's awesome. What a journey. Yeah. Not just <laughs> from agency to uh, brand side, but also all around the world in different countries and, and locations. That's pretty exciting. Yes. yes. I still, still America. So I still have not embarked into, into Europe, even though yeah. I've been tempted multiple times, but yes, still here in the, yeah, yeah. in this continent. Well, you mentioned in there that uh, we were going to get back to a story. And I want to start with that story because it's a really fascinating story. And I want all the detail. Let's hear your story of getting into, get the job in the U.S. and the whole story. And then we'll, and then we'll <laughs> dig into more about Creative Hustle. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're hearing the nail there. I know it sounds like, oh, like 20 years ago, it was different, blah, blah. But it, it actually was. It, it, like, I feel like now, it's not that it's easier, but there are definitely more people that had made it out of, of their countries and like, you have probably more contacts in the U.S., in Mexico, in Argentina, like in other countries in Latin America, where at that time, like it was very difficult. Like you didn't know anyone, right? Like not a lot of people were, were leaving the country to work abroad. Uh, so you had to get creative around it. Um, so, yeah, this was probably 2006 at Leo Burnett in Bogota. So, so Leo Burnett, for those who don't know, they used to have this internal competition called Camp Predictions. I loved it because I'm an advertising nerd. So pretty much what it was is like all the leads from all the Leo Burnett's around the world will select the pieces that they thought we are going to win at can, and they will select like the top 50. At the time, it was pretty much TV was like up here. We didn't have like the million categories that can now has. Uh, so pretty much those 50 pieces, 45 were TV spots. Uh, and the award, if you want camp prediction, was a trip to Cannes the year after. So my creative partner and me at the time, Christian Duran, uh, he now works for, for Apple. Uh, but at the time we were like, okay, this is, this is it. Like, this is the opportunity to go to Cannes because obviously Cannes for like our salary in Colombia was impossible. Like there was no way we can pay for it. So like a bunch of nerds, we looked at like all the results of the previous award festivals from the year, like New Year festivals and one show and Clio's. And we started looking like what pieces have done well, which pieces have not. And based on that, we literally did like a spreadsheet with like, okay, like this ad is going to win gold. This, because you get, you get scored not only if it wins, but like what award it gets. And long story short, we won it, the two of us with different pieces, which was like the craziest thing. Uh, not that we copy pasted everything because we did it like separate. It was like an exam, right? Like this is like SAT style. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we won it. Uh, obviously so happy, best day ever. But then leadership was like, well, the, the award is for one person, guys. Like you have to decide who's going. We're like, no, like we both need to go. So the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet, <laughs> sorry, the spreadsheet continues, but now focused on like, how do we make the amount of money that this trip costs work for both of us? Uh, so we're like, Hey, how much is, I don't know. At the time it was like 5k, everything. I don't remember if that was the number, but we did all the math. And then we came to, to leadership and we we're like, listen, like we can make this work. We can sign up as a student. We'll travel in the cheapest airline. We'll stay in the cheapest hostel we can find and we'll, we can both make it. So they were like, okay, like if you guys want that, go ahead. Like, of course the award is meant to be like a nice experience, like a nice hotel. And like, but we like, we all we wanted to do was go network at Cannes, but it was awesome. We managed to network. We managed to meet a lot of people throughout those conversations. This opportunity of Leo Burnett Hispanic came up. So the guy that ended up ha hiring us, Javier Osorio, he was not at Cannes, but we had said like a ton of like interviews and breakfast with people. We went to Barcelona to talk with the chief creative officer of, of BBDO at the time. They're like, we had like sent like so many emails, only a few replied, but it worked. And after we came back from the festival, he called and said like, hey, you guys want to come work for the Hispanic shop of Leo Burnett for Lapis? Um, so Christian actually went first because this was crisis year, 2008, no work visas. So they only authorized one and then they partnered Christian with another guy from uh, Miami at school. But as a backup, I had applied to Chicago Portfolio School to go as a student and be able to be legally in the U.S. Uh, so I went back to Portfolio School after working. I was there for like six months until 
they won another account, uh, US Cellular at the time. And that's when they offered me the, the job and when everything started. But yeah, it was it was quite a journey to get there. Yeah, I mean, not just, I mean, the luck of winning stuff, but it sounds like, you know, you guys broke it apart, really thought through every little detail and you, you were hungry. You wanted this really, really bad. And that's why you were both pushing. I kind of miss like that, like feeling. The other day we had a, a dinner with like some colleagues uh, in Toronto where we met for like these meetings that we are, are called Burst because we're all remote. So we all meet, talk, do meetings and then leave. And one of them was saying like, what's one year of your career that you like, miss or your reminiscence about and, and I was telling that story I was like this I I miss like that year because it felt like so good being so so hungry right yeah well that's interesting and it just makes me think of even you know breaking in is so hard when there's a down market and there's you know I had one job opening for a director of, of design and it was like you know 600 700 800 applicants you know type of thing for yes. a lot of these jobs and even at my last job at adobe it was the same thing like eight nine hundred people apply just for one creative director position so yeah. i think that there is still a moment of like how do you break through how do you keep that hustle up and how do you you know focus on on doing the right things back in the day when you were going through all this so you know you had a lot of hustle and when we're, when we're calling hustle, maybe we should define like, what do you think the definition of hustle means? Because it's not just like we said in the beginning, working extra long hours just for the sake of doing it. It's more yep, of like yep. finding that, uh, that creative spark in things. So let's, let's hear your definition of, of what it was for you. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good point. Uh, Cause yeah, I actually was like, I knew we were going to talk about it. So I was like, Oh, I don't even know. Like, the dictionary definition of hustle and that is like all these like forcefully like accomplishing something i'm like oh i don't know if that's the definition of hustle i want to be attached to i think it's more like being willing to like go places and try things uh and go like go far like literally go as uh like what we did for to be able to go to can right like just go the extra mile to try to make it happen because i think like as creatives if we if we don't do that, it's very easy to just get comfortable and like turn on autopilot and just stay there, which is fine. I mean, I've, I'm pretty sure moments of my career, I was, I did that. Like I was just like, okay, just like turn it down and just go in autopilot. But yeah, you don't accomplish things if, if you are not on it. And like this business is about like connections. It's about like moving. It's about learning. Like you really have to be like this Swiss army knife, a jack of all trades. Like if you're a copywriter and you stay copywriter all your life, uh, it's fine. But like your opportunities start like closing and closing. If you, if that's the only thing that you know how to, uh, so I think that's, that's what it is. It's like this constant need of like learning and connect and like be aware of what's happening. And when you put it in that context, for me, that's exactly it. It's like that desire, the passion, the, the drive, the, the, maybe instead of calling it creative hustle, it's more of like creative strategy or creative insights, creative, you know, zagging yep. where others are zigging, right? It's like really just exploring the space, just like we do with creative projects. It's doing that same thing around your career. Like, how do I get in over here? How do I try this? How do I, get access to this or, you know, get in front of someone else who, that can inform my career. So yep, yep. from my perspective, as long as you couch it in that, that it's not, it's not the hustle of like, you, you've got to work hundred hour work week, you know, it's more of like the, the creative passion and problem solving and, and, you know, just creativity at its core to, to apply yep. it to your career. So how has that changed from like when you first start out where you're in Colombia trying to make the US versus today, you know, getting your job at Shopify? Like what's what's the difference for your creative passion now versus back then? That's an excellent question. I think the 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 basics of it are haven't changed, right? Like this relentlessness of or like this drive that you're talking about to achieve goals and to like keep evolving in you you as a person and your professional career that that stays. I think what's different is is like the times of your life, right? So like to give you an example, when I was in, in Lapis at Leo in Chicago, this agency Cornell that they used to handle like all that Toyota business uh, with Sachi and Sachi, they offered me a, a job and it was a good opportunity. And I literally packed my bags and left like this in days, right? Like right now, 
with a family, obviously being so impulsive to, to doing these changes, obviously takes way more time, way more planning, schools, jobs, like, as the, the the older you are, I think like the more complex this gets. So like that flexibility of the hustle could be limited in that end from like a logistical perspective. But you can always you can always uh, find your way um, based on your interests, right? So for example, when I when I came to to Shopify, the job originally was like UX manager. And I was like, man, I had no idea about, I mean, I do know about UX, but like probably not at the level of like having a title be UX, right? But then I realized like in, in companies like Shopify, the names of the positions are different based like on your background. Like you could be a UX manager and be an art director. You can be a UX manager and be someone that is uh, in production. But like the basics of it was obviously always working with like the UX and everything design. Uh, around it, right? So I think I applied for like four different jobs here. And the recruiter at the time, he was like, no, man, like they don't see it because I did, my portfolio was like super advertising, right? Like big, flashy TV yep. spot, Super Bowl, but I didn't have like uh, websites. I kind of changed every time that I found one that could work. I kind of changed like my, my, the way I was selling myself and the way I was showing myself because I was still thinking of my portfolio like an advertising background creative. Like, let's just show the flashy stuff. And in reality, they didn't. I mean, of course, they wanted to see the flashy stuff, but they also wanted to see like the hardworking thinking that you have that maybe at the time for me was not portfolio material, but it was telling a better story of the Ethereum things I'm capable of. So I think just that process, wanting to get that, uh, open my eyes to 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 understanding the the game a little bit different. Uh, so it was all like not giving up. I guess that that would be like the lesson at this stage. And with what you're mentioning about like 600 applicants, like be the 601 doesn't matter. Like who knows if, if you stop applying because there's 500 people applying, then of course never it's not nothing's gonna happen, right? No, I love that, and it it really is. It's that. Uh tenacity, right? It's like, just no matter what, you just keep going no matter what. And I love even hearing of like the differences from when you first started out and we're trying to break in till today of kind of re rewriting your own story. I think that's a problem with, you know, I hear of a lot of people that they want to get this next job, but they're still just showing their resume or their LinkedIn prof profile of the old stuff they've done. But I'm like, we're creatives. We tell stories and design and create pictures and we can, we could easily tell a new story about ourselves. We could easily decide, you know, here, let me look at all the great skills I've learned and spin it or, you know, be a little more strategic about how we show what our work is. So I love that. I think that's pretty awesome. Yes. So yeah, how, yeah, exactly. I have a question for you though, because I think with the next generation, you know, obviously I said, I said the H word hustle and it was like a naughty word, but how do we change the <laughs> definition so that people aren't turned off and they're more thinking of like, okay, how do we really focus on more strategic and disciplined work and staying unexpected and tenacious? Like how, how do we change that definition with, with other creatives? That's a tough one. And I think it, it varies a lot depending of your cultural background. Like in Latin America is super ingrained, like the long hours is like, you know that you're going to work late. You know that they are going to order pizza. You know that you're going to be in the agency until 11. At least that's how it was when I, when I was there. Uh, in the U.S., when it's like you're pitching an account, is the same, right? Like you work weekends. You're just ordering food in the agency. Like, But I think you have to take a little bit more control of your life in that sense. And I think this is something that I learned with, with the pandemic. It took me years to find out but i was like remote working gives me like this crazy flexibility that i can organize my life the way i want to right of course you have meetings of course you have to be on for things but you can do a walking one-on-one -on -one. if you don't have like a document to revise or it's just a conversation you can go because you're like oh i don't have time to like move out of my desk no you can if you figure it out or you can like wake up earlier go to bed earlier and like work out in the morning and it will change completely your day. 
but man, it took me so long to just like figure, figure it out. There are some agencies that had a very, that I worked at where it was like a very, you know, like you said, late hour work hard kind of culture. And then there are others that are, you know, more tolerant and wanting, you know, be flexible. But I think it's also a matter of like creating our own culture. Like what is the culture we want to create for ourselves in, yep. in, in finding that passion and in finding, yeah, that strategic disciplined work. That's something that I try to uh, keep alive with me, even though I've been living in the U.S. almost as long as I lived in Colombia, which is crazy to think about. But one thing that is like ingrained, at least in our culture back home, is is, is like this hunger. Like we're like so hungry to accomplish things and, so, and also so passionate, sometimes too passionate. And like we have to be careful uh, not to like overdo it or overstay things. So today, what, what helps bring you fulfillment if it's not cans? What, what drives your creative spirit? What keeps you pumped and excited? I feel like since I've been at, at Shopify, what, what, what has been interesting is, is also at, in the ad industry, we're like very close. Like we are like advertising for advertising people, right? Like we, we're just like, we have the blinders and this is like, this is our world. But interestingly enough, right, like last week, config from figma mm -hmm. was also happening and like my conversations as slack a lot of them were based on like what they announced like what new features they announced for figma and like this chat that this person gave that was really good and i was like oh man like, yeah there's so much more out there than just like small advertising world so i've always been a big believer that you have to get out of that little box and like see what else is out there like the movies, uh, music, like museums, like there's so much like I live in Seattle and I miss a little bit of that like culture uh, that bigger cities had, like Chicago was great for, for that. Uh, but you can't just stay like, yeah, on that little universe because it's, it's too, it's too, it's too, it's too little. Well, that's interesting. You know, even you're talking about, you know, continuing to push and try and, you know, a lot of the talk today is AI and it's just, maybe we won't do, do a lot on this, but I'm just curious of like, are you seeing people pushing limits with that in, in driving, you know, a little bit of creative strategy in new ways? Yes. Yes. I mean, at Shopify, we're all over, we're all over that. Toby, our founder loves AI and he wants us to use the tool. He wants us to play with it. He wants us to, to figure out how to work quickly, work better. And I'm I'm a I'm I'm a geek, so I love that stuff. Actually, I I brought Mid Journey to to Shopify. Uh, managed to get like, well, with help of a team to get like licensing so that everybody yeah. could use it. But it started out of out of uh, out of need. So we were about to to launch this app called Translate and Adapt uh, app, which is it's a super cool feature that we created. That pretty much what it does is. If, if you have a store and you're selling in Japan, like you have to deal with their currency and their, and their language and also like adapt to the, to the current uh, market, right? Like in, in the UK, pants are no pants, they're called trousers. So this, this app will help when you have installed in your store, will help you with like all those things in order for, for your business to work in other locales. Um, so when we were going to advertise it, we didn't have like a lot of time. We didn't have like stock images that were working because we just needed like generic <laughs> products to show like the idea, right? Like we just needed like these generic pants. So at the time, this was back in October and Mid Journey was like a thing. So I just went there and like created a ton of assets and like shared them with like our uh, designer. I was like, hey, let's just use this as a placeholder. <laughs> um, and in reality, we ended up buying a license to be able to use those images that we created. And then like it started spreading out and people were asking like, hey, how do you did this? Like, is it possible to, to use your account for this? I'm like, oh, I don't know, we only, it's, I'm the only one supposed to use it. So with operations, I was like, listen, like there's interest. I know that leadership is interested, like just make it happen. And now people are like using it as a tool to, to help. I love that uh, quote that is not, AI is not gonna replace us, People who know how to use AI are the ones that are going to replace us. That to me is like the key uh, <laughs> That's on, good. on this. Yeah. 
Well, Nico, thank you. I know we're kind of at time here, but I appreciate hearing all of your story and, and your personal journey and creative hustle. And maybe is there any last minute advice you have for anyone like of doing the right stuff of hustle, of like the creative strategy and the focus and the tenacity and not doing the wrong stuff? Any last minute advice? Yeah. Keep like this spirit of reinventing yourself alive and keep learning stuff. Uh, I know that it's difficult when you feel stuck and like nothing is working out, but as creatives, like use your creativity in all the ways that you can, like write a book, think of a movie, like there's just so much ways that you can use your creativity again, like get out of that little, I'm a copywriter or minor director box and just explore all the things that you can do with a creative brain. Uh, and maybe you realize that maybe your future is not in an agency as a copywriter. Maybe it's like a script writer for HBO. I don't know, but there's just so many ways to use your talent that just don't forget that you have it. You have it in you. We're all creative. So just no, don't let, uh, yeah, don't let that die. Well, thank you. Thank you for all that good advice. That's even something I want to think about. Yeah. What else could I really do with my life? You know, I've been <laughs> I know me too. I, I believe me. <laughs> years, that doesn't mean it's over. You know, I can still, yes. I can still figure something out. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Yes, yes, it's yes. been a pleasure to have you on the show. To learn more about Nico's great work and to follow his career, you can follow him on LinkedIn. As always, you can find me at adamwmorgan.com. And finally, this show is produced by The Stoke Group, a full-service digital agency that specializes in content marketing, video, and interactive experiences. So if you're looking for a partner for strategy or content or anything else, visit thestokegroup.com. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you on the next episode.